you know, like I, I think that things like pornography and you know, those kinds of sexual diseases and the mind, I might say, are actually incredibly damaging because they break apart those primary relationships. They 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 take away trust and so forth, and and that is that is very destructive to happiness. Those kinds of of ills. Now, what. What I've done with my research, it's, it's with my institute, it's, it's interesting actually because what I started off researching was something very different. I was interested in why civilizations rise and fall, and which is about the most opposite thing you could possibly think of. So how can you get from that to mental illness? But when I, when I started to investigate it, what I, what I realized was, was happening was that there was changes in character and that what we think of as being political and economic forces are actually changing in the character of ordinary people. And there's a wonderful book called um, A Farewell to Arms, ALMS, by, by um, Gregory, Gregory Clark, which talks about how British character changed up to the Industrial Revolution, how you can understand the success of the Industrial Revolution as a change, not of institutions, but of character, and everything reflected that. So I, was, I came to be interested in that, and when I was trying to look at what character was driven by, I, I, I realised that it's actually a biological pattern. So we started looking at the, the, the rats and mice and also primates, monkeys and apes, and looking at their social structure and the way that the character affects that. So it came from, from history to character to the biology behind a character. And the interesting thing about that is that the most practical implications of my research is not so much to do with how you change society, but how you change individuals. And one of the problems we've got in the modern world is that our, our society is based on a kind of mental state, curiously enough, that has to do with food restriction. It's a biological pattern that's got to do with food restriction, which actually makes people have stronger families, care more for their children, work harder, have more communal responsibility. It's, it's a sort of a food restriction of things, and religious practice like chastity actually actually reinforce that. Now, what happens is when a society becomes wealthy and successful as ours is, and that's beyond anything known in human history, the wealth and the urbanization together tend to break down this fundamental character which is behind what makes civilization work well. And that has very, very bad effects on mental health. In actual fact, there's a lot of research that shows, um, the thing I'm looking at behind civilization is sometimes called slow life history strategy. It's, it's a long-term way of thinking about the world. And there's a lot of research that suggests that this, the fact that your life history strategy becomes faster, which means you tend to think more short-term. In other words, you, 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 you go out and see a prostitute rather than, or, or, or play with porn rather than having a good relationship with your wife. It, it's, it's, or you take drugs, for example, to get a, get a quick high. Or you, you, you steal. These are all fast life history strategy behaviours. And that's what's happening because the wealth and the urbanisation is breaking down this, this character. People are acting like that. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of findings to suggest that the, the fast life history strategy is actually behind a great deal of mental illness. Things like even schizophrenia, certainly addictive behaviours, um, and a lot of a lot of things to do with depression and so forth that are associated with that kind of activity. Because obviously people well, well, where do you think the biochemistry, the genetics, comes into it? Because I know bipolar, bipolar schizophrenia, for example, genetic conditions. Yes. Well, actually, there's not there's not there's genetic conditions, but even more, I believe, the problems are epigenetics. Right. Okay. So you're born with certain genes. But the environment affects the They're way act activates them, right? it activates or deactivates them. It, it puts things like called methyl groups on them. There's, there's different ways that environment can affect the brains. And that can actually be from your parents' generation. They found that, for example, the, um, the children of Holocaust survivors have, have specific kinds of, prob of changes to their, to their epigenome. The genome is still the same but certain genes actually passed down the generation. And we did a study with rats where we actually exposed the rats to, male rats to mild food shortage and then mated them with female rats. And the offspring actually behaved as if they've experienced food shortage, which, which is a fairly positive thing, actually. So it, it carries down the generations. And even, even two, three, four generations, it, it carries down. Um, so 
what we're looking at is changing character in a way. Now, there's two different ways to do it. And one of the, one of the suggestions from my theory very strongly is that smell has a very big part in, in, in mood. Um, and it's to do with, with the theory of lemming cycles, where, where different populations cycle in the same way, whether they're lemmings or muskrats or humans. And smells seem to be the thing. So I, I presume that's the case. So actually we did some tests where we took the, we put some animals without, with food restriction, and they typically have behaviours like they're more hardworking, more exploratory, they're much better mothers and so forth, um, compared with control rats. But we took the, the urine, the, actually the bedding from, the, from these food restricted animals and gave it to the, to the animals that have, didn't, weren't food restricted, and they started to behave as if they were. They showed the same kinds of positive behaviours, like, like they became much better mothers. See, domestic rats aren't very good mothers, as an example. Um, they, don't, they don't spend a lot of time with their young. But when you actually restrict the food or even just show them exposed to the urine, they actually start to look after their young, they get them back into the nest, they look after them much better. That's a good indication of, of healthy behaviour, which, of course, is very good for the young too because they, they actually progress much better in life when you get more attention. So that's the first thing we've done we looked at the effects of pheromones and we're doing experiments and what we're doing is trying to isolate whatever's in the urine that's having these very very positive effects and we've identified a, a series of um of pheromones hormones pheromones that that are and we're actually about to test them i actually want to use them myself but they, <laughs> they won't let yeah. me do it they say hey jim come on hold on mm. we'll do it on the rats first and then, yeah. and then we'll work out the right doses and then you can have a go at it yourself so you hope through this research you can apply it to Exactly right. And I believe that if we can, we can identify what's having this effect, um, all the indications are we can change people towards this slow life history strategy behavior, and we can actually dramatically help people to overcome um, problems like um, depression, like anxiety, like um, addictive behaviors, those kind of things. Now, the other side, far more fundamental, is this, is to look at the effect on the epigenome. In other words, what we want to do is to, is to change make changes to the genes. So these, these, these kinds of problems are very deep-rooted. You can't change everything just in adults because the, the genes are sort of set in behavior. So what we want to do, what we've, what we've done is we've identified certain changes in the epigenome. There's certain genes, when you have food restriction, there's certain genes that are switched on or switched off. That's what happens. That's why it goes down the generation. We've identified quite a few genes that are affected in this way. And fortunately, over the past few years, they've developed this system called CRISPR, mm. which is actually mostly applied to making genetic changes. And you, you may have heard this, the, the story about these people in China who, um, this scientist in China, who actually changed these babies so that they would be resistant to AIDS because the father had AIDS or something. Now, that's been very controversial. It's been, you know, all over the world. But, I mean, you can actually change the genes. Now... What I'm interested in is changing the epigenome, not the genes themselves, but the settings of genes. So if we can work out what's gone wrong with the genes, and we've already got good ideas about which genes are affected, we can actually use something. So it might be as simple as giving somebody an injection, and you can just basically clear away a lot of the toxic things that happened in their childhood or in the previous generation and make them, make them healthy in their minds. So you have somebody who's a hopeless addict, for example, is... is is besieged by addictive behavior, can't resist it, and you can actually offer them this, this treatment, which is up to them whether they accept it, that can turn them into happy, productive individuals who can just say no to the stuff. So it's actually, it's potentially incredibly exciting because if my theory is correct, everything has got to do with the, epig the epigenome. I mean, some people think genetics is the point. They think different races have different genes. I think that's pretty unimportant, actually. I think the differences that matter are epigenetic. So not only can we affect mental illness, but even conditions like, like poverty, for example, that you go to third world countries and, and if people wanted to do this stuff, they could actually have a change in character that made them incredibly productive and, and, and disciplined and, and organized. And, 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 and suddenly you've got people who are rising out of poverty. So, so the, the potential to relieve human suffering is enormous. So how far away do you think this, this sort of stuff is? Like, where are you at currently with your research? Well, look, I'd like to think that within the next year or two, we'd have an effective treatment for, really? in pheromone terms. Yeah, well, okay. we've identified some of them. And these are actual natural pheromones. They're not, they're not peculiar drugs. We're actually investigating. We're going to investigate some where there's existing drugs that could have this effect. 
but you know we, 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 we could be only a year or two away from having some effective treatment. The epig- on this is using pheromones. Mm. The epigenetic um, different uh, changes are a lot more slow. We, we are working on certain areas, but it's it's much slower to actually do because you've got to you've got to when you change the epigenome, you've got to actually. What CRISPR does is it zeroes it in on a particular section of the genome. It looks for it. It's sort of it's like a key in a lock thing. The trouble is you've got to know that you, you get that section only and not somewhere else because if you do that, you could have some very different effects if you change this thing over here, which could be to do with, I don't know, sexual function or something like that, and you could turn that off and suddenly <laughs> weird things happen. Yeah, yeah. So you've got, to be, you've got to be... It takes a lot of, of specialisation to know. But, I mean, technology is advancing so, so fast these days. One of the big problems with the blood-brain barrier that certain drugs don't go into the brain because it's protected very closely. So there's looking at ways to get around them, um, like with using gold nanoparticles and things. There's, there's, there's stuff happening all the time in this field. It's a really fast-moving, exciting field. I, I think it's unfortunate that we, we, we're spending so much time on, on the genetics because I believe the epigenetics has far, far more benefit. And the thing of it is, you know, I could spend few million dollars and we're hoping to get some government grants and stuff from this kind of thing as well uh, and, and 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 you could say and you could you could help literally billions of people with this thing because the effect you could get at the root causes instead of trying to treat the symptoms you get at the root causes. you're taking a reduction approach right. right back to the as you said the root cause right? yeah and we've got some very because because of my theory because we we, we have a fairly good idea which genes were involved and, and we know how to how to we want to, we want to focus on those <laughs>